real pleasure to be here to talk about uh, the subject of immense importance. Let me begin by talking about some of the failures of standard macroeconomics. And then what I want to do is to go on to try to describe why macroeconomics has failed so badly. And then finally, I'm going to try to describe some of the ways in which we can, you might say, repair modern macroeconomics and some of the policy prescriptions which were derived on the basis uh, 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 of, of these flawed economic theories uh, and how those policies have to be reformed. It's very clear that the standard macroeconomic model, which many of you may have had to suffer with uh, as students, uh, the, it's very clear that that standard macroeconomic model uh, didn't work very well. It didn't predict the crisis, which is clearly the worst crisis in 75 years. Uh, and prediction is the test of, of any science. So if you miss in some sense, the most important event, and you're supposed to be a, a science predicting, you've clearly missed uh, something's wrong. But it's worse than that. Most of the standard models, including those used by central banks and policymakers, argued that bubbles couldn't exist because markets are efficient and stable. In fact, What's striking is that many of the standard models assumed there could be no unemployment because they assumed that there was a competitive equilibrium and labor markets always cleared. And if there was unemployment, it was because of wage rigidities, implying that countries with more flexible labor markets would have lower unemployment, something that was contradicted by the ongoing experience where the United States uh, has uh, reputably one of the most flexible labor markets, and yet the United States has experienced uh, worse unemployment than Germany or many of the Scandinavian countries that have allegedly uh, less flexible labor markets. Not only didn't the standard model predict the crisis, not only did the standard model say that the crisis couldn't happen because bubbles didn't exist, even after the bubble broke, they argued that the problems were contained. Uh, in a famous speech, uh, Bernanke was asked about, uh, uh, the governor of the Central Bank of the Federal Reserve was asked uh, after the housing bubble uh, broke, uh, are you worried? And he said, no, we, you know, basically we, we are confident that uh, the risks were contained. Um, one of the problems of being a central bank governor uh, is that everything you say gets recorded by the press uh, and then you're held accountable and, and when you make a mistake of prediction, uh, everybody uh, knows about it. Well, it wasn't again that this prediction that the, that the consequences were contained, because they clearly were not. But the standard theories provided a lack of guidance of how to respond to the crisis. And they continued to provide lack of guidance after the onset of the, re of the recession. Uh, they provided lack of guidance, for instance, in how to recapitalize the banks, in how to design good stimulus measures. And partly because of this lack of guidance, things are still not back to normal. In the United States, the level of unemployment is unacceptably high. The official unemployment rate uh, is, you might say, uh, just less than 8%. But the unofficial unemployment, representing disguised unemployment, part-time workers, people who would like to work full-time but can't get a full-time job, is still almost one out of six Americans. One out of six Americans who would like a full-time job can't get one. 
And this is five years after the beginning of the recession, six years after the breaking of the bubble. So in a sense, there's been a, a lot of discussion about what were the causes of the crisis. And there's a general consensus, the banks were the most to blame. A general consensus that government, the regulators, the central bank, didn't do what it should have done to restrain the banks from the kind of behavior which they had engaged in repeatedly, historically. But part of the blame has to do with the economics profession. Because the economics profession, when I say that, I meant other economists. <laughs> I just want to make it clear. Um, the the uh, other economists, uh, because they actually provided the models that led the central bankers to believe that they didn't need to do anything to stop the banks from engaging in the kinds of behavior that led to the crisis. That they didn't uh, have, the, they, they used the, mo the models they used, as I said, said that these kinds of crises couldn't exist, the bubbles didn't exist. And even after the Great Recession began in 2008, the economics models didn't predict the next crisis, the Euro crisis, that broke out just a year later. Uh, many in Europe said, oh, look at those Americans. They don't know how to manage their economy. And then shortly thereafter, the Euro crisis broke out. And again, not only didn't they predict the Euro crisis, they haven't given good guidance on its management. And the result is this, that is that Europe is going into a double-dip recession. It's already in a double-dip recession. And in fact, Spain and Greece are in depression, with one out of two young people unable to, uh, are unemployed. And the unemployment rate would be even higher were it not for the fact that so many people have left these, so many young people have left these countries. Well, what went wrong? Why did the models fail, and why did the models fail so badly? Of course, all models are simplifications. That's what we mean by a model. But the key issue is, what are the critical emissions of the standard model? What they left out are the things that they shouldn't, and they focused on things that were not so important. They made a large number of misleading assumptions. Of course, the appropriate model depends on the questions being asked. And one of the problems is they weren't asking uh, some of the right questions. When, when I talk about the failures of the models, I want to be clear, there are a wide variety of models that were employed uh, by policymakers, by central banks. So any brief discussion has to entail some caricature. Uh, but I think the themes that I'm going to be talking about describe the most of the models that were central to the policy uh, uh, maker, uh, the macroeconomic analysis. So the problem is that the standard models made the wrong simplifications. For instance, I'll go into this a little bit more detail in a few minutes, but let me begin with, with uh, uh, a framework which was at the center of uh, much of macroeconomics uh, in the period after uh, uh, the, the 1970s. They used models which were called representative agent models, in which, again, for purposes of simplification, it was assumed that the economy could be described as if there were a, a single uh, individual. Now, for those of you who are not economists, it may sound embarrassing for me to describe the kinds of assumptions that economists make, because they are uh, so oversimplified, uh, and they seem so absurd. And so I have to apologize, but it is true that these are the assumptions that became fashionable uh, within the economics profession.
The problem with the representative agent model is that there's no scope for information asymmetries. Uh, so how is it possible when every, there's only one person for there to be any problem of uh, differences in information where some people know different things about, than other people? The only way that that could happen is for that representative individual to suffer from acute schizophrenia. But that would contradict the other assumption that they make, which is acute rationality. So you have an incoherence uh, if you, uh, you, you, between this acute schizophrenia and uh, keen rationality. Moreover, in the standard representative agent models, there is no scope for redistribution. Because if there's only one person, there's nobody to distribute money from one person to another. And so you can't ask the question, what is the effect of a policy on distribution? They have simply assumed away the issue of income distribution. And even if it was not something that, even if it was not an issue that you might be concerned with for uh, how it affects society, it affects behavior. It has economic consequences. Uh, changes in the distribution of income have severe implications for the economy. And that's one of the main themes of my book, The Price of Inequality. And finally, in our representative agent models, there's no scope for a financial sector. Because think about what the financial sector does. It takes money from one person and lends it to another. But if there's only one person, what it means is one person is taking money out of his left pocket and giving it to the right pocket. Not a very interesting financial sector. But we should all be clear, where was the center of the last crisis? The financial sector. So believe it or not, the center of the, finan of the economics community, the macroeconomists, formulated models in which there was no financial sector of any meaning. And obviously, if you don't have any financial sector, you're not going to be able to analyze the failure of the financial sector. So what I've been trying to do is, is to describe, just as one example, some of the ways in which modern macroeconomics failed to take, into a, to take account the realities of today and meant that they could not predict the kind of crisis that we have. Well, that brings me to the question, how do we come to this impasse? How was it that the economic profession wandered down this particular peculiar uh, course where they made these very strange assumptions? And to understand that, you have to go back to the 1970s, where there was an attempt uh, to reconcile macro and microeconomics. Before the Great Depression, there was only microeconomics. The economists believe, the mainstream of ec economists believe that markets worked well. It's called the classical school. That markets worked well. And when markets worked well, there was no such thing as unemployment. Well, in the Great Depression, when one out of four people were out of jobs, it was very hard to remain a serious economist and say there's no such thing as unemployment, even though most American economists did continue to believe that until about 1932 or 33. Well, uh, it was at that point that ideas like Keynes and Kolecki came to the fore and try to explain how it was that there could be persistent unemployment. Unemployment could persist for a long time. And that became the idea called Keynesian economics. And that became the center of what's called macroeconomics. But the problem was that the underlying hypotheses of macroeconomics seemed very different from the classical economics of microeconomics. So our poor students would take one set of courses learning about how markets worked very well, and another set of courses explaining 
unemployment and how markets did not work well. And many students found that difficult, having these two opposing set of ideas. And so there was an attempt in the beginning of the late 60s, early 70s, to reconcile the two branches of economics, macro and micro. Unfortunately, there were, two, there were two ways in which that could be done, and much of the economics profession, most of the macroeconomics profession, chose the wrong way. So one way was to change microeconomics to make it more like macro, and the other one was to change macro to make it more like micro. And the mainstream of macro tried to convert macro to be like micro, to go back to the old classical ideas. So they began with assumptions that there was no unemployment. Well, if you assume, a, write down a model in which there's no unemployment, you're not going to be able to explain unemployment. You've ruled it out. I, I should tell a little story here that when I was chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Clinton, I faced a very difficult problem because we were, we were uh, uh, hiring, uh, I had to uh, hire some macroeconomists, and particularly under President Clinton, uh, he was very engaged with the Council of Economic Advisors and very non-hierarchical, so, so he, he would want to meet with some of the younger people on our staff. But most of the macroeconomists had been trained in what was called the Chicago School, which believed that there was no such thing as unemployment. And if you remember, President Clinton had run for the presidency in 1992 on a platform of jobs, jobs, jobs. It's the economy, stupid. And so I just had this nightmare. I would hire one of these economists who didn't believe in that there was such a thing as unemployment. He would have a meeting with the president, and the president would say, I'm worried about the unemployment rate still being so high, and this uh, economist would try to explain to the president, don't worry about it. There's no, so these people really are not unemployed. They just are enjoying uh, leisure. <laughs> and at that point, there would be one more unemployed person, namely me. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I, I've often, uh, uh, you know, your school is a, a, a multidisciplinary school, and uh, uh, when I talk to the Chicago economists about this fact that people are, that they claim that people are just enjoying leisure, I say usually when people uh, enjoy leisure, they're happy. But the unemployed in America, in Spain, in Greece, are not happy. They're committing suicide, they're getting divorced, they have all the symptoms of acute unhappiness. So I said, how do you reconcile it? And my answer was, well, that's a problem for psychiatry, not for economics. <laughs> well, the point I want to make uh, is that the mainstream of macroeconomics took this particular course of going back to the classical competitive equilibrium theory, assuming that markets worked well, there was no credit rationing, no unemployment. The irony was that this was happening just at the time when microeconomics was going through a revolution, because microeconomics was really redefining itself to be more like the old macroeconomics, trying to understand why markets were not often working. The theory of asymmetric information that was been referred to, game theory, behavioral economics, explaining why people are not always rational, a whole series of, of reforms or, or of, of, of advances in microeconomics explained why that classical theory was wrong. So the consequence is that, that uh, these two strands uh, divided and most of my macro went down the wrong strand. 
What would, again was so striking about the new theories of microeconomics was they explained why there could be unemployment. They explained why there could be credit rationing, why there could be a problem with liquidity. In a theory of where all capital markets clear, where the demand for credit is always clearing, you cannot have a liquidity crisis. And of course, the liquidity crisis is one of the major aspects of the crisis of 2008 and continues to be a major problem in many places around the world. Most importantly, the Chicago School or the new, new classical uh, macroeconomics, real business cycle, a whole variety of, because it was based on the old classical economics, really came to the view that markets normally worked well. They believed in Adam Smith's invisible hand, that the pursuit of self-interest would lead as if by an invisible hand to the well-being of all society. But the major advances of microeconomics in the 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, including the work uh, that I did with Bruce Greenwald on uh, the consequences of asymmetric information and imperfect risk markets showed that uh, the reason that the invisible hand was often or typically invisible was that it wasn't there. That markets were not in general constrained, prey to efficient. Well, if I were going to go through looking in more detail about what were the worst mistakes that the standard macroeconomics made, besides the problems of asymmetric information, besides the problems of imperfect competition, I think I would identify uh, two or three. One of them was the assumption that everybody was perfectly rational. If you looked at what happened in America's financial markets, there is no way that you can reconcile what happened with a high degree of rationality. Yes, there were some people who were rational exploiting other people's irrationalities. And they made a lot of money doing that. But they could only do that because other people were irrational. Uh, a second major problem was they really ignored the importance of credit markets. I'll come back to that very briefly a little bit later, but they tried to summarize the entire financial market in terms of demand and supply for money. A single equation based on transaction demand for money. But credit is more complicated than that. And because they didn't model credit, they didn't model the banking system, they didn't understand what happened when credit disappeared and the banking system was on the verge of collapse. To me, it's, astound, uh, it's amazing that so many central banks, including the Federal Reserve Board, used models which ignored banks. <laughs> because if one thing you would think the central banks would, under, would, would be concerned about its banks. But among the economists, they acted as if banks were just an institutional detail that could be ignored. And you could just look at the demand and supply for money. And following that, they didn't really understand very clearly the channels through which monetary policy exerted its influence. They focused almost exclusively on the interest rate. And even today, you see that focus, that obsession with the interest rate, when many economists, almost the majority of mainstream economists in the United States, suggest that the main problem, that reason that monetary policy today is not effective is called the zero lower bound. The argument is that if we could, you know, we've lowered interest rate to zero, 
if we could only get interest rates lower, we would succeed in stimulating the economy. And what they do is make a, a, a reference to the Keynesian liquidity trap. But the situation in the Great Depression and the situation today are totally different. In the Great Depression, we had deflation. Prices were falling at the rate of about 10% a year. So when you couldn't lower interest rates below zero, the real interest rate adjusted for inflation was 10%. That was a high real interest rate. And that meant that discouraged investment, almost surely. But right now in the United States, the rate of inflation is around 1% to 2%. So the real interest rate is negative. The real interest rate is about minus 1, minus 2%. Does anybody really believe that if we lower real interest rates to minus 3 or minus 4 percent, suddenly investment would start in the United States? No. So it's not the zero lower bound that's the real problem. It's something else. It has to do with the credit channels and the credit mechanism that's been broken. And because they haven't understood this, because they focused on the role of the interest rate, they haven't really fixed a financial system, and they haven't understood the underlying sources of America's continuing malaise. Well, let me just go through some of the ways in which monetary policy, based on these flawed models, has been uh, misguided, and how that misguided monetary policy in the United States, let me make it clear that uh, in India, things were uh, done much better, uh, uh, but where monetary policy in the United States was misguided, and where uh, the result of this uh, has been that uh, the economic performance has not been particularly good. And I'll just list uh, about six or seven, seven propositions here. The first is that the financial markets can be, banks can be, uh, we can rely on self-regulation. Now that's a very peculiar idea because if you look historically, we've had constantly bank failures. <laughs> Why suddenly beginning about 1980 you can start trusting the banks not to fail when there's been 200 years, 300 years of bank failures was a mystery. In fact, one of the interesting things, if you go back and read uh, some of economic history, for instance, Charlie Kinderberger's book, one of the things he points out in looking at the bubbles and the crashes that have been persistent for hundreds of years was that each time we have a bubble, they would say, oh yes, we know that there were bubbles in the past, but we're smarter than the past. So this hubris has been one of the consistent themes of history. And it played out again in the Federal Reserve in the lead up to this crisis. To me, uh, it was obvious that self-regulation wouldn't work because there are pervasive market failures. And when these pervasive market, there are externalities. And whenever there are externalities, you cannot rely on self-regulation. After the crisis, of, uh, the, uh, the crisis began in, uh, in 2008, in 2009, Alan Greenspan, was at, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, was asked to testify to Congress and he gave a famous speech in which he said there was a flaw in his reasoning. Minor flaw that cost several trillion dollars. Let's put aside the, uh, th that point. But there was a flaw in his reasoning. What was the flaw? The flaw was that he believed that bankers would manage the risk better. He was surprised. But I was surprised that he was surprised. Because 
as an economist, there's one thing that we agree on. We don't agree. We were contentious a lot, as you know, and we disagree about almost everything. But the one thing that most people agree on is that incentives matter. If you looked at the incentives that the bankers and the banks had, they had incentives to engage in excessive risk-taking and short-sighted behavior. And they did. If they didn't, we'd have to rewrite our textbooks. But of course, fortunately, we don't. But unfortunately, the world has suffered a great deal. So anybody looking at, anybody looking at, at the incentive structures in the banking sector should have been worried. The Greenspan ignored these deep agency problems, as we call them, that were pervasive in the sector. But he also didn't understand the fundamental responsibility of regulators. You know, if I gamble or, uh, and I lose, if I go to Las Vegas, it affects me, it affects my family, but it doesn't affect the macro economy. But if Goldman Sachs or Citibank gambles with other people's money and it loses, it affects our entire economy. That's why we have bank regulation. And if the regulators like Greenspan don't understand that, then we're in trouble. But again, it wasn't an accident because we had a regulator who did understand this, Paul Volcker. And he actually succeeded in doing what most people thought are the central mission of, of, of uh, uh, central bankers. He got the inflation rate down from double-digit levels to very low levels. And how did President Reagan respond to his success? He fired him. Why? Because he understood that there was a need for regulation. And President Reagan wanted a central bank governor who didn't believe in regulation. And so the result of that is we had an era in which the mantra was self-regulation. And let me make it clear, it, if, if Greenspan hadn't been appointed, somebody else with the same mentality would have been appointed. It was part of the era of the time. I don't think we should focus on any particular individual. It's the nature of of, of, of the era that we're talking about. Let me mention a couple of the other general principles that uh, uh, influence monetary policy. There are a large number, and I can't go through all of them. One was that central banks ought to focus on inflation. They ought to target inflation. The hypothesis was that keeping inflation low was necessary and almost sufficient for good economic performance. There was never any good economic theory behind this. What we learned in the crisis was that the losses from financial instability were orders of magnitude greater than the losses from low to moderate inflation. And as I said before, the loss to the United States economy from the financial crisis is already in the trillions of dollars. The difference between the actual output and the potential output amounts since 2008 is in the trillions of dollars. And that overwhelms any small loss associated with if inflation had gone up from 2% to 3% or 4%. If you look at any model, you can't get any number anywhere near that. The good thing is that today, central bankers have learned that lesson, and in the United States and many other countries, they've now added financial stability as one of the major criteria. And actually, in the United States, there's been a big change in the last few weeks where there's something called the Evans Rule, where the central bank is now focusing on unemployment. It says it will not lower the, it, it will not raise the interest rate until we get the unemployment rate down. So one of the things is clear that the single-minded focus on inflation was wrong. 
A third mistake was a single-minded, I've already referred to, was a single-minded focus on the interest rate. As if that were the only instrument at the disposal of the central bank. And the central bank shouldn't use regulatory mechanisms. The reason for this peculiar view was the belief that one shouldn't interfere with the market. But central banks are by definition interfering with the market. They're setting one of the most important prices, the interest rate. So how could you believe in a coherent way that you should not interfere with the market when you are by definition interfering with the market? Now there's another proposition that they could have argued that it's optimal to interfere only with one instrument or in one aspect. But there's no theory behind that. In fact, those of you who studied optimal tax theory know that the great contribution of Ramsey was to show that in tax policy, it's better to have lots of small taxes than one big distortion. So again, there was no theoretical basis to that conclusion. What we know now is that central banks should use all the instruments at their disposal. Let me go back to the crisis. In 1994, the US Congress gave the Federal Reserve a wide range of additional tools. They said that they had the responsibility to manage the mortgage market. They had the responsibility to make sure that the level of down payments was sufficiently high to stabilize the market, that the people loan uh, income to, to uh, service requirements were uh, appropriate. In other words, they said, you can't just rely on interest rates. You have to look at a number of other regulatory uh, mechanisms. One of the members of the, Reserve, of the Federal Reserve Board pointed out that there was a bubble growing and that had to be contained. And if we didn't contain it, the bubble would break and the economy would be, would be in a disastrous position. But Greenspan and then later Bernanke basically said bubbles don't exist. And if they exist, we can't tell them. And if they can't, even if we could tell them, there's nothing we can do about it. But there was something they could do about it. They had the quantitative, they had the regulatory uh, authority to do something about it. And eventually, after the crisis, they did something about it. But that was, to use an American expression, it was closing the barn door after the horses are out. Well, uh, the general proposition here is that one sh there are many instruments and that one should use all of them, particularly once one recognizes that one of the major mechanisms for macroeconomic control is credit availability. That it's not just the interest rate, it's the spread between, it's not the T-bill rate, it's the spread between the T-bill rate and the lending rate, which is an endogenous variable, and it's the availability of credit. And those, ver those things, credit availability and the spread, are affected not just by the open market operations, but all the whole set of regulatory structure uh, that the central bank can impose. A fourth proposition that was felt by many central bankers was that innovation was necessarily good. And they looked with favor at all these new financial products that were being invented. But what they should have realized was that in the financial sector, there was a very large discrepancy between private rewards and social returns. And when there's a large discrepancy between private rewards and social returns, not only are resources misallocated, which they were, but also innovation is directed in the wrong direction. And they had an incentive to innovate in ways to circumvent regulations, they had incentive to innovate in ways that made our economy less stable and actually less efficient. Since the crisis, there's been a host of research explaining how these additional products 
have contributed to financial instability. Before that, it was just assumed that any new financial product, if there was a demand for it, was a good thing. To me, what was so surprising was that how little innovation there was that would actually make our economy work better. Let me give you an example. Uh, for most citizens, for most Americans, uh, the major asset that they have is their home. And you would have thought, therefore, that managing the risk of home ownership would be what the financial sector would focus on. But what they did is they invented products that made it riskier to own a home. And the result of that is 7 million Americans have lost their homes. Now, 7 million in, in India sounds like a small number, but for America, it's a big number. 20% uh, of all homeowners in America now are underwater. That is to say, they, own, they owe more money than the value of their home. We expect not only an, another several million of Americans to lose their homes. So the mortgage market has been an absolute disaster. Many of us pointed this out, but the financial sector was not interested in innovations that made risk-taking, risk markets work better for most Americans. They were interested in new products that increased the transaction costs. And they were very successful to the point where profits in the financial sector represented 40% of all corporate profits. The financial sector is supposed to be the servant of the rest of the economy. It's supposed to be efficient. And if that's the case, it should be a small fraction of the other rest of the corporate profits. They're supposed to be helping other people make profits, not taking all the profits away from them. The bottom line was summarized, I think, very effectively by Paul Volcker when he said, reviewing these financial products, said he couldn't find a single financial product, financial innovation in America that improved the efficiency of the American economy and promoted its economic growth except the ATM machine. And there he was a little bit wrong because the ATM was a British innovation. A fifth, a fifth example of, of a proposition that was widely held but turned out not to be true was a belief that diversification, interlinking, would work. One of the reasons I said, I said before that Bernanke believed that when the housing market collapsed, the bubble broke, that the risks were contained was that he believed that the risk had been diversified. And many of the risks had been sold. When I, give, when I, when I talk about the crisis in Europe, I always thank the audience because Europe bought about 40% of America's toxic mortgages. And if they hadn't bought so many of them, the economic downturn in America would have been much worse. But of course, we made uh, the crisis in Europe much worse. Uh, uh, that's an, an aspect of globalization. But the assumption was that diversification would, would spread the risk and therefore lead it to be contained. But it's interesting, if you look at the implicit assumptions that the IMF, that in fact most macroeconomists make, there's again a kind of intellectual incoherence. After the crisis, what do we say? What is everybody worried about after the crisis breaks out? They all worry about contagion. Well, the word contagion is a word that's borrowed from epidemiology, from diseases. When somebody has a disease, do you diversify? When you have somebody has a disease, you say, well, let's take that disease and let's spread it all over the world so we can diversify the risk. No, that's not the response. What you do is you want to isolate it, contain it, right? Well, uh, We have an incoherent set of models that says that diversification is a good thing before the crisis, but a bad thing after the crisis. 
But our mathematical models and our policy always ignores the second part of the story. It only focuses on the first part about how diversification spreads risk in a good way. Well, those of you who know the mathematics behind this, the reason is a very simple one, that the, all the standard models made assumptions of the absence of non-convexities. And when you have non-convexities, and they're pervasive in economics, bankruptcy, learning curves, all kinds of non-convexities, when you have non-convexities, spreading diversification can make the system more unstable, can lead to systemic risk. It's one of the reasons why when you have all these CDSs, the world can be more unstable and systemic instability can be increased. So the bottom line that I want to emphasize on, in this is that in the models that were used by the central banks all over the world, they ignored the risks of interlinkages. And the reason they did is they made mathematical assumptions about the absence of non-convexities and if they had not done that, they would have come to very different conclusions. The reason why I emphasize that, particularly in an academic context, is the models that we make, the precise assumptions, make a very big difference to the conclusions. And quite often, we don't understand fully the nature of the assumptions that we're making. And that's the nature of academic inquiry. The final proposition, uh, um, there are two more propositions I want to talk about very briefly. Uh, one of them is uh, when macroeconomics doesn't work in the way that uh, they should, central bankers have a proclivity to try to blame somebody else. So if you listen to Trichet, for instance, in Europe, what was the problem of unemployment in Europe? It wasn't that he had misconducted, uh, it made a mistake in the conduct of monetary policy. Uh, central bankers never make a mistake. They're, they're like the Pope. Um, there's a kind of infallibility there. Uh, they always like to blame uh, others. In this particular case, it's either the fiscal policy or wage policy. And Trichet liked to blame both, but particularly wage rigidities. Uh, but I, I explained before that actually America, the United States, has the most flexible labor market, and yet we had higher unemployment than Germany or Sweden. So our economy didn't function. It wasn't labor market flexibility that was the key issue. Or take another example. You know, one of, one of the ironies is, uh, of all this is that the central banks don't like anybody interfering with what they're doing. Uh, because that's, uh, when I was in the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, every time I would start saying that uh, there was a mistake by the central bank, uh, I would be yelled at and say, you know, you're not supposed to talk about monetary policy, uh, even though it was important for that macroeconomic performance. But central bankers often don't feel the same um, inhibition about commenting on the rest of uh, economic policy. So one of the famous examples of this was Greenspan in 2001 uh, supported uh, the tax cuts uh, that the United States, for the rich, that the United States couldn't afford. And you, you all know about the fiscal cliff and all that problem. That all began, the critical thing, uh, the critical, uh, uh, Greenspan played a critical role if he had not supported the, that, those tax cuts, they would not have been adopted. You ask, what was the argument that he used for these tax cuts that were beyond the ability of the U.S. to afford? Well, it was really interesting because it, it shows you the fallibility of prediction and the fallibility of economists. Uh, what he was worried about was at that point, we had a 2% of GDP surplus. Amazing that we went from 2% GDP surplus to our current situation. Important moral of this, we could reverse that fairly easily just by reversing what we did that we went when we had 2% to our current situation. But he said we have 2% surplus and he was worried. What was he worried about? That we were going to pay off the entire national debt. 
The country faced an emergency, he thought. We were about to pay off the national debt, and since he only believed in open market operations, if we had no national debt, he could not engage in open market operations. And so he said, uh, we had to do something now. We can't wait. Now, I always thought this was one of the worst arguments I have ever heard from anybody, uh, certainly from an economist. So, because I always, I felt that if, say, in 10 or 15 years, we were on the verge of paying back the national debt, the governor of the central bank, the chairman of the, several, uh, of the Federal Reserve, could come to Congress and the president and say, I know this is difficult for you, but we need more debt. Uh, for monetary policy, will you please cut taxes or spend a little bit more money? And I cannot believe that Congress and the President couldn't respond to the national emergency of uh, cutting taxes and spending more uh, by doing that. Uh, but he felt, Greenspan felt, that we had to act now in 2001 and have the tax cuts for the rich then. Well, we all know, as they say, the rest of this history, we wound up with these huge deficits um, that we are now struggling with. The final issue I want to talk about in the panoply of issues that have been at the center of the standard macroeconomics and monetary policy is central bank independence. And I know the context of independence in each country is, 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 is different, um, but, uh, and what the words independence mean uh, differs, but one of the things that the crisis has shown is that those countries with the most, with the more independent central banks did much worse than countries with less independent central banks. The United States and Europe were at the, core, at the center of the crisis. The countries that did better were China, Brazil, and India. And the reason for that is understandable in terms of the political economy. There's no such thing as, as truly independent institutions. They're always going to be accountable to somebody. And if you're not politically accountable, who are you accountable to? And the Federal Reserve became accountable to, reflected the interest, got captured by Wall Street. And so it came to reflect the mindset, the frame, the way of thinking of Wall Street. And so while a central bank's job is to take away the punch bowl when the party gets too raucous, they, they began to think of, like Wall Street, that there was no party. It would go on forever. And so that's why they believed in these ideas of self-regulation, all the ideas that I just described, were ideas that were actually in the interest and within the ideology of the financial markets. And so I think the, the, the lesson out of all of this is that we have to be, think very carefully about the kinds of institutional structures uh, that will, uh, are appropriate uh, uh, for democratic societies. Well, uh, going beyond these particular failures, um, part of the problem of macroeconomics was that it was not asking the right questions. The test of a good macroeconomic model is not whether it predicts a little better in normal times, but whether it anticipates ab abnormal times and describes what happens then. For instance, if you were doing physics, uh, you would say black holes almost never occur, but still black holes played a very important role in the development of modern physics. Standard economic methodology would discard physics models in which black holes play a central role. Recessions are a pathology through which we can come to understand better the functioning of a normal economy. So the problem was that most of macroeconomics focused not on the severe downturns like the Great Depression or the Great Re Recession, which really are the test of the model, but on trying to predict a little bit better normal economy. There are three major puzzles which they should have focused upon 
The first is, and these are major puzzles in understanding the deep fluctuations which I believe should be at the center of macroeconomic analysis. The first is the puzzles, the, the, the presence of bubbles, which have repeatedly occurred. Um, the important point here, and uh, one has to understand the, the difference between the standard model and, and, and these is, in the standard model, the source of the perturbations to the economy are exogenous shocks. Something that happens from the outside, technology shocks, something in weather, something outside. But if you look at the current crisis and most other big crises, they are created by the market themselves. The bubble was created by the market. It wasn't weather, it wasn't uh, innovation, it was something that was created by the market. So we have to understand how markets create the disturbances that we then have to deal with. The second thing we have to understand is fast declines. We normally think of economies as having large buffers, shock absorbers, like inventories. But in fact, if we look at how the economy behaves, shocks get amplified, at least certain shocks get amplified. And uh, th there is a kind of, of acceleration of effects. You get a, a, a shock, a, a downturn, like, which would seem relatively small, like the real estate crash, but it then goes, gets amplified with severe macroeconomic consequences. And the theories that uh, I and colleagues like Bruce Greenwald and many others have developed explains why that is. Financial constraints uh, provide, I think, uh, uh, explanations of why shocks get amplified, and they give rise to what are now called balance sheet recessions. The third thing, and the most disturbing, is why are there such slow recoveries? Yes, there were large losses associated with the misallocation of capital before the bubble broke. But most of the losses occur after the bubble breaks, in the persistent gap between actual and potential output that I've referred to several times before, mounting and now ready uh, to the trillions of dollars. After the breaking of the bubble, there were the same human, physical, and natural resources that there were before the bubble. There are the same resources today, basically, as there were in 2007. And yet, the failure is that we are not using those resources fully. And what's even worse is in Europe, and in some strands of thought in America, there are those who advocate policies of austerity that will result in the gap between actual and potential output getting larger. So that we, they will exacerbate this problem even further. Again, in principle, debt should not be an impediment to the full utilization of resources. It only affects claims on national income and assets. Who gets the returns? So standard theory predicts a relatively quick recovery as the economy adjusts to, you might say, the new reality. Um, and sometimes that is the case with what is called a V-shaped recovery. But sometimes the recovery is very slow. And our economic model should explain the persistence of these, the effects of the shocks. And again, so far, I think the best models are those based on credit market imperfections, the fact that rebuilding the balance sheet takes time. But I want to emphasize that the current crisis in the United States and in Europe goes beyond a balance sheet crisis, beyond, goes beyond a financial sector crisis. The financial sector, in fact, is largely repaired. The current crisis is really related to a structural transformation like the Great Depression, the movement as a result of productivity changes and globalization uh, from a manufacturing economy to a service sector economy. And markets don't make that transition very easily. If you go back to the Great Depression, the Great Depression can be viewed as 
a result uh, as a reflection of, uh, of the movement from the agricultural economy to a manufacturing economy. Agricultural economy used to be 70% of the workforce. And then, result of productivity increases in agriculture, we need fewer and fewer workers to grow the food. Today, in the United States, we have about 3% of the labor force in agriculture, and they produce more food than even an obese population can consume. But we had to move people from agriculture into something else. And the market didn't do that very well. And there are good theories related to credit market constraints that explain why markets don't make the transition easily. The result of this was we got the Great Depression. And it was only through government action, particularly World War II, but World War II was a, not only a major Keynesian stimulus, it was also an industrial policy. Because in order to fight the war, we had to move people from agriculture to industry to manufacture the armaments, to people who moved to the cities, to housing. And then we had the GI Bill that trained uh, millions of Americans and uh, gave them a higher education so that they could be equipped for the economy of the mid-20th century. And so now we're going through that same kind of transformation from manufacturing to a service sector. But unfortunately, rather than having government play the role of facilitating that, government's now cutting back. And the prospects of this transition being done smoothly are becoming bleaker and bleaker. And that's why I think that the prospects of an extended period of unemployment in the United States and in Europe are, are very high. Let me conclude. Most crises are man-made. They're not caused by famines or other natural disasters. They are the result of inefficient and unstable market processes, made worse in recent years by a system that introduces new instabilities, imposes impediments to adjustment, and creates adverse dynamics. The policy responses, both before the crises and after, have, at least in many cases, made matters far worse. As I've argued, the crisis is not only a crisis in the economy, but also should be a crisis in economics. The standard models contributed to policies that led to the crisis have provided us little guidance on how to respond. But the good news, and the good news, is that the building blocks with which alternative theories can be constructed are already available. The research in economic theory over the past 30 decades in microeconomics has been enormously rich and productive. I've talked about theories of game theory, behavioral economics, institutional economics, theories of information, uh, information economics, asymmetric, uh, asymmetries of information. So we have an, uh, theories of banking, credit, we have many of the uh, building blocks. Um, I'd like to think some of the work, for instance, that I've done with Bruce Green Greenwald on the new paradigm to monetary economics provides uh, the building blocks for, for the theory of credit. So the failure was really on the part of macroeconomics, a failure to integrate adequately these microeconomic insights into the macroeconomic models. And this is one of the main challenges going forward. In the future, I think it's less likely that a single model, a simple but, in, as it turned out, wrong paradigm will dominate as it did in the past. There are obviously important trade-offs in modeling. Greater realism in modeling banking or shadow banking. Uh, introducing some of the key distribution issues, which I haven't had time to talk about. Introducing some of the key financial market constraints. Any of these are going to complicate the model, and it may necessitate simplifying the model in other less important ways, such as intertemporal maximization. Um, complexities arising from intertemporal maximization over infinite horizon I believe are far less important 
than those associated with accurate depiction of the financial markets. But what should be clear at this juncture is that the macroeconomic models that have dominated the economics profession for the last three decades have not served our economies, our societies well. And it is time to build on these building blocks uh, that uh, economists have been working on for the last three decades to construct a macroeconomics and a macroeconomic policies, monetary economics and monetary economic policy that will serve our societies and our economies better than the models that we've had in the past. Thank you.